The following is an excerpt from a live event in our series, Multidisciplinary Approaches to Resilient Landscapes. Please enjoy this conversation with Noel Kingsbury and Micah Derrida, collaborators on the new book, Gardens Under Big Skies, Reimagining Outdoor Space the Dutch Way, interviewed by Martine Carrion von Rijn. There seems to be a, uh, an increased popularity and interest in meadows. And in the book, you say that, in the, at least in the Netherlands, most meadows are artificial and they're, the real ones are, are very rare. And that, that the term of meadow is generally misunderstood. And, and it, all of this connects, of course, to the changes of the agricultural practices uh, as a big component in the Netherlands. Can you explain or expand upon this, uh, upon the, the meadows and, and the, this movement and interest? Well, a, a meadow is has, has actually quite a precise definition, which is a, 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 a grassland that is cut in midsummer, sort of late June or early July, uh, for for hay production, and then allowed to to regrow. So, so basically, the meadow is, uh, you know, a, 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 an, anthrop an anthropogenic construct that, uh, because of the particular flora of of, of Europe, ended up with a, a very very rich flora. Uh, but of course, with agricultural intensification, uh, the use of uh, particularly the use of nitrogen-rich fertilizers and the promotion of ryegrass, you know, meadows have become uh, uh, essentially very, very dull. And real meadows, real wildflower-rich meadows, are, are very much restricted to to nature reserves. Um, but the meadow has become a real source of inspiration for uh, domestic gardeners, for, for designers. Uh, because it is this species-rich grassland. And it's now used, in fact, very loosely, very often just to, to refer to plantings, perhaps like this, that have a, a, a strong element of repetition of, of herbaceous elements, but you know, just capture something of the, um, of the traditional uh, meadow. So in a way, like the Dutch gardens, or at least some of the Dutch gardens, are very much an, uh, an interpretation of, of a meadow mm -hmm. in a different way. I, yes. I remember yes. that from yes. Pitu Dolph, that mm -hmm. he, he brought a lot of, the, a lot of plants from the, from the prairies in uh, North America, which yes. is a different kind of meadow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yeah, I mean, the, the recognition that these grassland floras are or can be in incredibly biodiverse uh, and are very often the result of a very, very long history of evolution. Um, and that, you know, their loss through agricultural intensification um, has uh, stimulated a lot of interest in how they can either be reconstructed or used as a source of uh, aesthetic inspiration. Yeah, one of the interesting facts that I've, I've learned is that meadows or like prairie grasslands have probably the, the richest and the best soils in the world. So... Mm -hmm. It's interesting to 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 add yeah. this to. Uh, the, in the book, you talk about a younger generation. Uh, it, 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 one of the things I really enjoy was you speak about different generations, and one particular designer, younger generation, Arjan Bocco. Uh, yes, but not only young. The the pre the pre ones you um, you showed were young as well. A lot of yeah. them, most of them are young. I see. I understand. Yeah. By so, which we uh, mean younger than us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, and and he he has um, he's he's very much a plants person and uh, he has uh, is is very good to remark his interest on perennials and uh, and woody plants. But he has a particular practice that is very interesting. That uh, where he in one of his uh, yes this roof terrace where he used. Um, so some drought tolerant plants, and then on difficult areas, he seeded those areas to ensure the survival of the most appropriate plants. And then uh, do you see this as an under underutilized idea, an uh, underutilized concept, or is it something to consider more for summer, for summer dry conditions only? I think with seeding, you are... Uh kind of inviting the plants really to choose their own uh, spaces. You're, you're setting off an ecological process, 
which is inevitably dynamic. And of course, you don't have nearly so much control over the outcomes. It's just that those outcomes might have a greater stability. Um, and I think particularly with <coughs> environments like green roofs, which are, are very challenging and therefore analogous to uh, challenging thin soil natural environments. Uh, you know, seed, seed part planting plants, seeding would be a very interesting way to go. And um, there's various British researchers, such as uh, Professor James Hitchmore at the University of Sheffield, who's done a huge amount of work on, on using seeding to create uh, biodiverse, but very aesthetically driven uh, planting design. So I think we will probably, but also, of course, allowing plants to, to self-seed, you have your, you plants in a mix and some of them will begin to, to seed and you know that is seen as the start of, of, of a dynamic process the gardener or the garden manager then is essentially uh, overseeing and and, 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 and and editing in the book you speak about several partnerships which I, I, yes. I thought they were very interesting because I think they speak very much about the Dutch and these partnerships and one in particular vis-a-vis -vis with Margot van Bean and Emil Versius Vers Luis, uh, they stand out because of the sustainability and ecological planting designs. Now, in there's a particular project in Appleton that, that is in the book, the Ville de Velde. And then uh, you share interesting points about uh, that the ecological gardening has been gearing in the Netherlands and, and, and more towards institutional users where maintenance of those gardens requires education. Then you compare how those designers work with clients in the US. Can you talk about approaches on how you rec recommend uh, talking to or training uh, homeowners on how to maintain their landscapes, especially when they are ecological, uh, ecological uh, gardens? Yeah, I mean, this, this this awareness of the importance of sustainability, I think, has been in the Netherlands longer than uh, many other countries. Um, but uh, whilst researching this but one of the things I was particularly impressed by was talking to uh, a number of designers who essentially supplied the new garden owners with a manual. Um, with the, the detailing all the plants, what maintenance they needed. It really, really was it's very, very thorough you, you user manual. I, I was very impressed by that. That's a good tip. Yes. So is, is that something that, I mean, you know this practice much better than I do, Mark. Uh, I mean, how much training do they, De Marco and um, Emil, give their, their clients? I don't. I don't think it's it's a sort of a training, uh, and it's not only Michiel. Uh, it's not only Michiel and uh, a, a lot of lot of designers um, of the uh, well of, of a, a certain certain generation do that. The ones uh, we discussing in this book, all of them are um, having a very close relationship with the clients, and I think that's the real base actually to. Um, um, to a, a, a sort of education here, mm -hmm. here in the U.S., one of the big the big um, issues is trying to train the people who actually do the maintenance in uh, uh, to do yeah, this yeah. ecological environmental practices. It's, uh, it's because not many people are trained, so it's a very large, large idea, very large scope. Yeah. And also talking a bit, a little bit about this savvy, these gardeners and, and homeowners. And the, in the book, you speak about uh, this overlap of uh, savvy gardeners that want to do design, home, perhaps homeowners, uh, and designers who are gardeners in themselves. And I believe the Pacific uh, horticulture audience may be particularly interested in this overlap of savvy gardeners interested in design or designers who themselves are gardeners. Where do you see this potential evolution of designers and homeowners, gardeners that, uh, are, where, where, that are all supporting ecologi uh, ecological approaches? Where do you think this is going? Um, well, I, I think in both Britain and the Netherlands, there's a real sort of um overlap there's a uh, well there's, there's a real sort of continuum between uh domestic gardeners and and, and professionals um 
partly because with long traditions of, uh, of horticulture, there's a strong level of, of confidence I think people have in their ability uh, or their desire to uh, to, to manage gardens them, them themselves. Uh, there's a lot of good garden education around. Um, and I, I think elsewhere you might find, um, well, certainly my impression of certain parts of the United States is that homeowners are sometimes more dissociated from, it, from their gardens and, and, they, and they, they, they farm out the management to uh, professionals who are often kind of relatively unskilled and just main, and, and, and maintain rather than really allow a garden to develop. You could argue that you have to allow a garden to really grow and develop. You have to be, you, you know, you have, the manager has to be the owner because only they will see it uh, from, from, from day to day and, uh, and learn all the idiosyncrasies that it will, it will inevitably have. We go back to that idea you were talking about the, between uh, uh, maintenance being, being about really caring about the garden and not necessarily yes. about. Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. I mean it's Larry Weiner, isn't it? Uh, who says who says I hate the word maintenance. You know we should stop using it because it implies that you've got this one level, uh, and you're always trying to keep to that level. That, that that development is very much more because you you've got something living and it's always going to be changing. Uh, uh, and this idea of the garden developing is is actually a much more valid way of thinking about it. Or, mm-hmm. Yes, here in the West, we have two terms. We, we, we use sustainability where we feel is like where the garden is staying, but we've mm. started using regenerative uh, as the idea, as you're saying, where uh, the garden yeah. is actually growing, becoming alive uh, yes. uh, on its own. Mm, 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 mm. Yes. Um, going back a little bit to, to the science and the design's profiles. Um, yes. Uh, many of the of the gardens, especially in the cultural section of the book, you speak about uh, the design profiles uh, that seeming to evoke discipline uh, with control lines, and and yet the the plants themselves they were very much uh, alive and and uh, and doing their living on their own. Of course, you have many examples of those. Uh, one of them is Monique Donders and Pierre, Pierre van der Heiden where one of the things they, uh, you say that uh, about them is the control landscapes have uh, modernistic, la- clear lines of design. Can you speak to this cultural influence of this idea uh, where the plants uh, appears uh, jub- jubilant with the con- within the confines of the boxes or the structure of the garden? Um, well, I would say it probably goes back to a long history of designing within uh, small spaces that are often very geometric um, and uh, a long history also of, of there being books for the public on garden design. I think they go back to the 17th century um, and also perhaps being a flat landscape again. I think that enforces a particular awareness of perspective on you. Um, over, over to you, Mahika. I think I think it has to, um, to do with what you said in, in that we don't have so much space and we have to work with uh, a minimum of space and using it as as profit uh, profitable as possible. As you can see, a clear structure combined with planting. Um, uh, so there's some because of this the the, the small spaces um, you will. Um, it, it will have more clearness um, if it has clear lines. Um, yeah, just uh, a, I, I think. Uh, sorry to uh, interrupt because I, I think there is there is in the book you put, you you speak about Baroque garden history and mm-hmm. how it basically like that whole idea is somehow the the sensibility trickles down into the modern styles today. Uh, and, and you speak about, for example, the flat that flatness uh, seems to support this geometry because mm-hmm. it obviously organizes uh, the, the the space and the, and this you can see through through the the, yeah. the garden. So how does this characteristic apply today? Uh, and how has all this uh, trickled down to 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 the, to modern designs, particularly in the Netherlands? This is a clear example of of flatness, um, uh, um, modern, um, 
the Bauhaus sort of what what uh, what Noel uh, or already mentioned, and um, also um, um, the strongness of combining people uh, like. We had these combinations of designers, but this is, for instance, uh, a kennel, a channel, a kennel garden in um, the center of Amsterdam, and there are three. These are actually three gardens combined as one, um, and um, I think this. When you only look at the picture, you will have the answer of your question. <laughs> yeah, this was one of my favorite gardens in the in the book. It's so beautiful. It's very clever. It's three separate ownerships exactly. integrated into and one that, whole mm -hmm. by, by the designer Robert uh, Brokema. And the canal, yeah. uh, or, or, or anyway, the water feature combines the three gardens. Like, yeah. Yes, talk about partnership and connection, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which yes. is very much yeah. demonstrated in this garden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were talking about uh, about small spaces before, and in the book, one of the 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 well, a designer, Carlene Barkman, she she want, she seems to be particularly known for small gardens. Mm -hmm. In the Netherlands, there's of course having this the uh, then dense demographics. Uh, it encourages people live very closely and and encourages people to ap appreciate nature. The shared nature. So, uh, how is this the small space utilized for great effect? And I can, I, I believe Carlene has a, a lot of great examples from that. Uh, yes, I mean she she is um, you know the past. Um, I mean, she, she's just brilliant at designing small, small spaces. Uh, and uh, I, the last time I met her, I said, is this entirely through choice? And she said, well, no one's ever asked me to design a big garden. Um, and I just wonder what would happen if she if, if she were. Uh, no, she, she is really very extraordinarily inventive. But, you know, she's she's has a fantastic love of plants. And in her gardens, you will find an incredible range of plants. And here we've got a garden that's essentially a woodland garden. It's quite heavily shaded. Uh, there's a lot of that really wonderful foliage you find typically in shaded environments in this small urban space. Um, and uh, another, but another real favourite actually is, let's uh, move on, this one here this where we've got almost like a meadow, this very sort of naturalistic planting in um, a square garden. And square gardens are really the most difficult often to, to, to work with. Um, but I think Caroline's work, I mean, she was, when we were talking about her work, she said to me that all of her designs have a twist. They have a kind of like a um, an unexpected element that she... I think she feels she doesn't have much control over it. it just kind of happens almost kind of subconsciously intuitively and I think this is kind of at the heart of why Dutch design is so good I mean I, I uh, I'm not a great fan of contemporary architecture but in the Netherlands I see so many office blocks buildings that elsewhere would just be really boring and I just look at them and think this is deaf, this is better, this is different. And it's so often because there's a twist, there's something's been done to just give it that element of kind of character. Um, it's something that seems to be very deep within the design culture, very rational, but at the same time, this extraordinary openness to these kind of intuitive twists that give a particular design real personality, humanize it, and also somehow knock knock off the knock off the sharp edges. Yeah, well, that was, I think, one of the big, big things that came across reading the book is, is this relationship and trying to reinvent spaces and this relationship between, between nature and man, or like, uh, like you, you mentioned very well, between the engineer's world and the naturalist world. And, yes. and I think this garden is really represented very well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there and was I one more. To note something as well, which, uh, which I, I yeah, th thought of. Um, Dutch garden designers don't tend to put big works of uh, structural art um, no. in their gardens. It's it's all about the structure on the gar in the garden itself. It's it's and um, um, I think that's very that's a very important difference to the approach. Um, perhaps that is given because of the small space that they have, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 
There was one more question that I wanted to ask, at least if we have time. It's uh, you mentioned the, the intersection of Jack P. Tyson, uh, the parts of I'm still being. There is a very interesting concept and idea where uh, I believe other designers in the book touched also the, on the topic of creating plant communities and plant sociology. Can you expand upon this concept, concept or idea? Yes, these uh, these originally these date back to the 1930s, and as such, are one of the, if not the longest example we have of ecological management. Now, they are very aesthetically driven. I mean, you would never have this many uh, king cups, Calpha palustris, in one place in the wild, uh, but it's almost entirely native plants, um, and the process of management here is. Um, it's working very much with natural processes of, of succession uh, so that plantings are allowed to develop and age. And then when they get to a certain point, uh, everything is, is, is cut back to basics and the area is started again. And this, so it's almost like a cyclical process. And so you end up with this patchwork of habitats of different ages. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful example of this real um, balancing act between working with natural processes and intervention, um, and that the results are hugely successful. I mean, these are quite narrow parks in awkward urban spaces in a, in a, in a suburban area, and hugely, uh, I mean, nowhere is more than a few hundred metres from the nearest bit of uh, residential um, you know, housing areas, and so obviously really very highly visible public uh, spaces. This seemed to be a wonderful exploration of the, what you were talking about before, of, of, of having plants, let, letting plants do, do whatever they need to do and, and allowing to be. Uh, are there many native plants included in this? In this uh, well, almost, entirely, mostly? Al almost entirely, yeah. yes. Yeah. And the only uh, non-native are some of the bulbs really, aren't they, Marco? Excuse me. Uh, I think the only non-natives are some of the bulbs. Yeah. Some of the spring yeah. bulbs. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a, that's a whole whole other Stinson, subject. Stinson plants. It's it's yeah. well known for the Stinson plants, which are actually uh, plants um, brought back from uh, um, in in the, already in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century, and which preserved is... in in uh, houses which. Stone houses, that's why the name Stins, Stins Stone House. It's, it's actually it's state, it's state owners. Yeah. It's quite mm. interesting because being on a land where the land has been worked for so, so, so much for so many centuries, it's, it's uh, finding what it, it, the question, at least that came to me, was what is native? So it's interesting that these gardens actually reflect a native landscape of the Netherlands. The, the first question, question is from Saxon Holt. Is the Dutch style a rejection of a more formal man controls nature with clip borders, etc., or an embracing wild, wilderness and habitat? Um, well, I, I think to me it represents this, this real dialectical relationship between nature and culture. Um, and uh, what's interesting about what's great about the, these gardens is that there is that they are they are strongly cultural and very often strongly natural, and that's also a reflection of the sort of current uh, state of land management in the country, whereby uh, these areas there's this program called Room for the River, whereby areas of what were once farmland are set aside for uh, for flood control so there's, there's less management they're more natural uh, there seems to be this real um balancing between the need for you know, engineering to manage water but also uh, allowing space for, for for nature where that fits in with the, with the plan so you know, personally this is why i find dutch landscape so interesting because it's a a sort of a model almost for how we need to, to manage the planet. Um, there's an interesting question here from Sue about looking at this from the US, do you think our great space and variety works against us in defining a Pan-American style? Uh, what do you see coming out of US design that's most forward thinking and catches your eyes? Well, my experience with the United States is that precisely because it's so big and so different that 
that there are so many different garden cultures who tend, in my experience, not to talk to, talk to each other. You know, if I've just landed in Chicago from, say, New York, and people in Chicago will say, well, what are they doing in New York? Or I will say, mention something and they, about happening in New York, and they'll look at you with sort of blankly as if to say, well, that's a foreign country. And I think one of the strengths of the US is, is, is diversity. Um, and uh, regional styles, I think, are are hugely important and that obviously ties in hugely with with using the appropriate native native plants and i think that brings me on to uh in my 30 odd years of visiting the united states the growth in the native plant movement has been you no know, one of the most extraordinary things i have seen um and uh i think enormously hopeful in driving forward not just good biodiversity and designed environments, but also uh, regional, uh, really appropriate regional um, design work. There was uh, one question that I wanted recognizing, wanted to ask, and uh, was uh, recognizing where these ideas come from and looking for looking uh, forward. Where does the the idea of naturalistic garden planting go next? Well, we've got still got a huge amount to learn um, in terms of how you can uh, set up and manage uh, combinations of plants that will have a, uh, a, a strong dynamic without needing a huge amount of maintenance, uh, particularly in a situation of ongoing climate change. Um, and I think that will keep us all very busy for a very long time to come. Um, and I think uh, the, 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 the strength, perhaps, of, of the Dutch garden tradition is that uh, I think it makes it easier for us to appreciate how we can include naturalistic as well as more formal elements and get that creative tension working. Um, but I, I, I think, yeah, personally, I would say we've got, we're, we're still really in, in the very early days of, 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 work, of making this work. From Jennifer de Graaf, uh, in your design process, do you draft out each plant and its location, or do you select quantities based on percentages and then only do the layout on site, or do you have any other I, method? I, I, I use the mixed planting technique where you are basically designing a vegetation. You uh, select a mix of plants and their proportions, uh, and and then and then randomise. And that's very much. Uh, the approach I like because it gives you a much more naturalistic look. It's about it's about creating a vegetation, um, and inevitably there will be change over time as things seed and, and spread. Uh, but that's for me very much part of the uh, the, the intention of the of, of the planting. You close the book honoring uh, Min Rouse and Pete Aldorf and Hen Harrison and the Dutch wave. Do you want to add to that? Um, well, yeah, we uh, we had to end with Pete really because Pete was the has been an extraordinary ambassador for uh, for planting design in general and uh, Dutch work in in, in particular. Um, and I think. It's an interesting question. You know, what will, how will planting design develop uh, after when he finally um, re retires? We may have to pause on that, but thank you so much, Noel. And this was just very, very generous of you and Micah and Martin. Thank you all so much. This has been a very interesting conversation. I think it's incredibly inspiring for those of us on the West Coast and elsewhere to hear a, a different perspective on a lot of the same ideas that we're all connected to. Um, so I just want to thank you all again. I hope everyone buys this book. We have a wonderful discount for members. So it's, you, you know, you have a great opportunity there from Philbert Press. And then there is another book out as well. I don't know how Noel is doing this. <laughs> it's like a magic trick. Well, this book was massively delayed. It took, it took two years to convince the publisher to, exactly. to do it. Another two years to write it. And then there was the world paper shortage and COVID. So it, no one it needs to know. Time. You just, you just, you know, simultaneously <laughs> toss out amazing books into the world that, that are so thoughtful. So thank you. And thank you again for collaborating with us. And Martin, thank you so much for hosting this conversation. It's really exciting to have uh, the California APLD chapter collaborating with us as well.